This is Mr. D'Angelo Hall. He'll be your presenter for this morning. If y'all, Mr. Hall. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming out this morning to meet and greet with me and uh, hear my spill on campaign finance rules and regulations and reporting, all that fun stuff that you guys like to do. <laughs> so I'm not going to keep you too long. Um, hopefully we won't, we won't, it won't take me long to get through my presentation and um, please feel free to ask as many questions as you need to, um, any questions, concerns that you guys have had. Um, by a show of hands, just so I can kind of get a feel for the room, how many candidates do I have here? Um, okay. Um, any incumbents currently seeking another term right now? Okay. Any, well, state, statewide, or is everyone local? County, municipal? Okay. Good. All right. So the presentation that I have up today um, is for county level. Please forgive me. Um, I get really hot easily. So <laughs> if you guys have ever seen the videos online, there's this one video I just bust out in a sweat. It's kind of <laughs> funny. <laughs> so please forgive me. Um, I try not to pay attention if I'm just too glossy up here. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to take you through. Oh, let's see here. All right, so this is my outline. So we're going to go through the Campaign Finance Act. Uh, talk about some campaign finance lingo. Um, then from there, we'll talk about the filing schedules. We're going to go all, oh, excuse me, we're going to go over all of the campaign finance forms, the campaign disclosure report, the personal financial disclosure statement. We're going to also talk about the different forms that you guys completed when you guys began accepting campaign contributions when you guys started with the campaign. So, if, yes, sir. We're actually this. Oh, you need me to talk into the mic? Yes, I can okay. get you the handheld too, though. Okay. We'll get it turned up. Sorry about that. Do you guys need me to repeat the question for the for the recording as well? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the campaign finance lingo um, in the campaign finance act. Actually, in your folder there, uh, there is a one sheet on the different forms and reports uh, that will basically follow the uh, the presentation, and you can use it as a reference later. Also, if you take a look in the Campaign Finance Act, you may want to jot down this code section, 21-5-3. Uh, that is the code section that uh, lists all the different definitions uh, that you may come across when you're either looking at information on the commission's website or reading through the code or even just looking over a CCDR. Um, so you may definitely want to get familiar with those things. Some of the lingo that I'm talking about is, like I said, the CCDR, which is the Campaign Disclosure Report, PFDS, Personal Financial Disclosure. Um, you may, may already know what a DOI is, hopefully, because if you've been accepting campaign contributions, you should already have one on file. <laughs> uh, so just, just so you know that that is on the one sheet on the different forms and reports on the left side uh, for you, though. Um, so you may hear me refer to one of the acronyms throughout the presentation today. Um, we'll talk about the election year schedule. We'll talk about the non-election year reporting schedule as well, the personal financial disclosure. I know that is a, a, another question that we get a lot from locals. Um, if they need to file it during the election year, I'll talk about that a little more um, later on. Um, we'll talk about late fees. Hopefully no one has filed their reports late. Um, those fines are, they can increase uh, rather quickly. Um, so, but hopefully no one's, uh, getting ding with that. We'll talk about contribution expenditures, ordinary and necessary, um, things that are prohibited, um, civil penalties, and like I said, answering any questions that you guys have. So like I said, if you have questions throughout the presentation or if I'm going too fast or you need me to repeat something, just let me know, okay? All right. Uh, so let's start off with, like I said, the, the lingo under 21-5-3. I think it's very important that you all know and understand these terms, these are some of the ones that you may see most commonly, um, like, a, like with the uh, election year or non-election year. Basically, um, in your election year, there are certain reports that you would file in an election year, depending on when you achieve your candidate status. Um, there's also certain reports that you file when you're in a non-election year. And it, sometimes, for some people, it's a little confusing to keep up with the schedule. But, but if you ever forget about it, just go online to ethics.ga.gov. Um, and you can get a copy of your filing schedule there. Um, contributions. 
I want to put this up here because sometimes with campaigns, especially at the uh, county and municipal level, we see a lot of um, self-funding from the actual candidate. They're using their personal funds to uh, you know, get the campaign started. Uh, but just keep in mind, even if you are contributing your own personal funds to your campaign, though, though that money is still considered a contribution, uh, regardless um, if you want to be reimbursed or not. Uh, you still have to report it, and it still needs to go on the CCDR. Um, so these are just a couple of things you guys can reference this later. I don't want to bore you with it, um, but definitely jot down 21-5-3. You may have to refer back to it later. Okay. Um, this is also the code section where you can find the definition of ordinary and necessary, um, the definition of a candidate's campaign committee, and there are a few other um, ones that I may even refer back to this section throughout the presentation today. Um, so the forms and reports. Um, I don't want to bore you with these because hopefully these look familiar to you uh, or you may have already completed one prior to now. Um, these that you see on the screen right now, these are the forms that are filed directly with the commission. Um, these forms do not go to the election superintendent's office. So you do not want to file these forms at the county level. Um, and those include the RC, which is used to register the campaign committee, um, which is the first form on the left side. Um, in the middle there, that is the PIN application. The PIN application is just used for identifying purposes. That's how we send you your follower ID. Um, that's that number that begins with the letter C that you put on your campaign report or the number that begins with the letter F that you received from us. Um, that's how you would get that number through the PIN application. Um, the other form up here is the CUSA. Um, and that's choosing the option of separate accounting. So by a show of hands, is, is how many people have registered their camp or how many people have registered a campaign committee? So we do, okay, so just keep in mind um, for everyone else, if you are receiving assistance um, from your spouse, your kids, nieces, nephews, um, going door to door, accepting campaign contributions, um, if you have someone that's monitoring your website, accepting contributions for you online, um, then keep in mind, you know, by definition, you would have formed a campaign committee. Um, so if so, then you need to make sure that your campaign committee is registered with the commission. And in order to do that, you need to send this form in um, to our office. You can mail it in. You can walk it in. Um, either one is fine. But just keep in mind, if you do form a campaign committee, you are required to have that committee registered with the commission. And there always has to be someone listed in both positions of the chairperson and the treasurer at all times. Um, if there's ever a vacancy in either seat of chairperson or treasurer, the committee would not be able to accept contributions unless and until the vacancy has been filled. Um, do you have to do that every four years, or do you just do it the same people can just not file? So if, if, if there's no changes, I'm sorry, the question was, um, do you need to update your committee registration every four years? Um, that was the question. So. Once you register your campaign committee with us, that registration will remain active, will remain on file for as long as you hold that seat. Um, now, if there are any changes uh, you know, with your officers, then of course, like I said, you want to make sure that you update us with that information as soon as possible, because if there's a vacancy, you can't accept contributions. So just keep that in mind. Um, another thing um, you may want to jot down, if you have the PIN application on file with us, um, you can actually make changes to your officers, your committee officers, through the commission's e-filing system. You're not going to use that system to file your reports, but you can make changes to your campaign um, chairperson or treasurer through our system. Um, or you can send in another form and just check the box that says amend it, and we'll take it from there. Okay, um, But you don't need to update it every year. Um, that's the same thing for the declaration of intention, um, the form CUSA, you know, those things remain um, active for as long as you hold that seat. Um, any other questions about the RC campaign committees? Um, the form is really easy to complete. Just make sure you complete the whole thing. Oh, another thing um, for the campaign committee, the law does provide that the uh, the campaign chairperson, that the candidate can serve as both the campaign treasurer and the chairperson. So that is permissible. Um, if you want to also delegate tasks to other individuals, you can do that as well. Okay. <clears throat> record keeping. Um, you definitely want to make sure you all are keeping uh, detailed uh, bookkeeping, record keeping. Um, it would be considered an ordinary and necessary expenditure um, if 
you know, you, you know, you guys were to go out and hire an accountant or a bookkeeper, someone to keep everything in order for you. That's something that is common um, and we see it a lot. It's actually encouraged. Um, sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming for yourselves um, with everything that you have going on. Some, so sometimes it can be a bit much for you guys to try to make sure everything is lining up correctly. And so it's not a bad, I don't think it's a bad idea um, if you did have the help. But if you do have the help, just make sure you're registered um, <laughs> and make sure you have everyone in place um, so that, you know you don't have to worry about anything. So definitely keep detailed bookkeeping. You want to keep your accounts current within seven business days just in case a member of the commission acts to take a look at your records. Usually that doesn't happen a lot, but you know sometimes complaints are filed and then that could cause um, you know, things to come into question where, you know, someone may want to take a look at your records just to see um, what's going on. Don't be alarmed. It's just, you know, just have it, you know, that's why you want to keep it in order and have it prepared. So um, you are required to have a campaign depository account. That account can be an interest bearing account. Uh, just keep in mind any interest that you receive from that account must be reported and it gets reported on the CCDR um, on the summary page. Um, you all want to make sure that you are preserving your records for at least five years past the termination date of whenever you leave office or whenever your campaign has dissolved. Um, you just want to make sure that you're able to reference that as well. Uh, any questions about record keeping or anything so far? Um, all right. Choosing the option of separate accounting. Uh, this is a form that I don't see that, that I don't see a whole lot of people at the local level file. Um, sometimes. It really just depends on your race if you, you know, decide to file it. It is optional. It's not a requirement. Um, what this form would allow you to do is basically accept contributions for multiple elections simultaneously. So what I mean by that is, um, let's just say you're running in a nonpartisan election. Um, there's the general election, and then maybe there's the possibility of a, a general runoff. Um, if you have the form CUSA on file, the CUSA would allow you to accept contributions up to the maximum limits for both elections at the same time. So you can accept the $2,600 for your general election um, in addition to um, another $1,400 for the runoff. Um, if you do not have the CUSA on file, you are only allowed to accept contributions for your next upcoming election. All right. Um, sometimes people look at this as having an advantage um, over their opponents. It just depends on the race. Uh, like I said, it's totally optional, but if you would like to uh, choose the option of separate accounting, this form must be filed directly with the commission, so either mailed or hand delivered to our office. And this is another form. Um, if you do have the PIN application on file, you can actually choose the option um, through our e-filing system as well. All right. Um, another thing, if you do select to choose the option of separate accounting, um, when you go to file your CCDRs and you show your contributions, it's kind of hard to see. Um, I'm not sure if I'm able to zoom in on this laptop, but um, on this picture, uh -oh. on the right side, it's actually a clip out of, well, from the CCDR, but the, the field that I have highlighted um, that's, that's where it says election cycle. So if you are accepting contributions for multiple elections, um, we just filed, you, know, you all just had that June 30th filing period. So when you go to itemize your contributions, if you are accepting contributions for multiple elections, you want to show there um, if the contribution was accepted for the general or if it was accepted for a future election. Um, and if it was accepted for a future election for like a runoff or something like that, you can check general, runoff, primary, or special, whatever the case may be. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, with the PowerPoints, I normally don't send out my PowerPoint presentations. I actually refer to the one sheets because I'm always making changes to my PowerPoints and sometimes it doesn't always translate well. Um, but the information, I'm fine with the information that's in the PowerPoint, but if you see any mistakes, feel free to send me an email or, uh, but definitely, definitely feel free to contact us also if you have questions or concerns. Um, but yeah, try to use the information in the one sheets or that <laughs> that are in the photo, but you're more than welcome to use the, the slides as well as a resource. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. The 
PIN application, we talked about the PIN application a little bit. It's really easy. We just need you to register your email address. You are required, actually, to register your email address with the commission, and this will be the way that you do that. Um, a lot of times, people send the form to their clerks, but try to make sure that you send it to us directly um, so that we can have it in the system. Um, and again, this is how you get your follower ID. So that follower ID that starts with C, the number that starts with F, this is how you get that information. Um, you just complete the PIN application. It does need to be properly executed um, and notarized. Um, and once you do that, you usually the turnaround time is within 24 to 48 hours pro for processing. And again, like I said, with the PIN application on file, this is um, how you can actually go online to make changes to your campaign committee officers um, or if you want to select the choosing the option of separate accounting and things like that. <clears throat> Also, if you need a PIN application or a CUSA form, or if you need to update your campaign committee registration, I also have some of those forms with me today. So if you need one, I have one for you. All right, so now let's actually talk about the documents that are filed with your local filing entity, which is basically pretty much everything else. Um, so the Declaration of Intention, hopefully that looks familiar. The, in the middle there, we have the CCDR, and on the right is the Personal Financial Disclosure Statement. Um, we also have the Affidavit of Exemption. Now to exceed the $2,500 in, co in contributions and or expenditures, the two business day report, and also the final report and termination statement. <clears throat> All of these are filed with your election superintendent in the county or with your city clerk if you're seeking a municipal office. Um, I don't want to bore you with the DOI because I know everyone has filed one. Who hasn't filed a DOI? No one. Okay. Darn it. <laughs> Yes, sir. If you file a DOI, you're running for office, and you lose, and then you want to run again next time the office comes up, you do have to file a new DOI for that new office. So the question, the question was, if you file a DOI for office, you are unsuccessful, and you would like to run for that same office again during the next election cycle, will you need to file another declaration of intention? Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can go about that. Um, if you are unsuccessful and you know for a fact that you will seek the same seat again in the future, um, you do not have to terminate your campaign. You can actually keep the account open. Um, if you are going to keep the account open, just be mindful that you will be required to file campaign disclosure reports in those non-election years. So if you are unsuccessful and you forget about that filing schedule, you're going to be hit with those late fees if you don't file the reports. Um, the good thing is, since it's, you're at the local level, you do have the option to file the affidavit of exemption. Um, so it's really, the ball's really in your court. Um, some people will still terminate the account because they don't like the, the weight of or having the pressure of having to remember to keep up with the filing schedule. Um, and then some people keep it open. I've, I've seen it go both ways, but I've also seen it go where people forget about those reports too. Um, so that's the main thing. If you are going to do it that way and keep it open, you can, um, but just make sure you stay on top of the filing schedule. Um, and if you want to go ahead and terminate the account, if you do terminate the account, then yes, you will have to file another declaration of intent. Once you file that final report and termination statement, it it's, seals it all up. Mm -hmm. That was a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so basically, Anyone who's accepting campaign contributions, even if they're self-funding um, their campaign, they're still required to file a declaration of intent. The only way um, that someone would not have to file a declaration of intention is if they only pay for their qualifying fee out of, out of pocket and nothing else. That means that they're not um, making any other expenditures on behalf of their campaign. Um, they're not purchasing any stickers, any business cards, any pencils any push cards, nothing. Like, the only thing you pay for is the qualifying fee. That's it. No ads, no Facebook ads, nothing. <laughs> no going no going door to door, nothing. <laughs> well, I know about the going door to door part, so maybe not, but you can't spend any money. <laughs> you can't accept any money. <laughs> we don't see it a whole lot, but I have seen it happen before, so. Uh, any questions about the Declaration of Intention? All right. Um, you can also reference, I tr um, try to make sure that I put the code sections at the top of each slide. So if you want to jot down the code section or if you want to um, write in, in your act, um, you know, what that code section requires, that's fine too. That's actually how I do it at work. So when you guys are calling me with questions, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm just flipping through looking for my, my side notes. So it helps. So if you want to try that, it may be worth it. 
Um, but this is under 21-5-30 um, G, little g. <clears throat> all right, the campaign contribution disclosure report. Uh, this is where you show all of your campaign's activity, everything that has occurred, everything that has come into the campaign, everything that has gone out, everything in between. Um, I get a lot of questions all the time. Do we have to report contributions that are less than $100? Yes. Where? You have to show it on the summary page, okay? Um, that's where it goes. Now, can you still itemize those contributions? Yes, you can. Um, you can go above and beyond. You can be extra transparent. It's nothing wrong with that. Um, the people in your district may appreciate it. Uh, so it's nothing wrong with it. If you want to itemize every contribution, that's totally up to you. Um, but the law does require you to itemize contributions that are more than $100. So more than $100 means uh, 100 and a penny. Um, the same thing for expenditures. Expenditures that are more than $100, you have to itemize those expenditures as well. Um, any contributions that are more than $100 and they're, and they're from, well, and it's from an individual, you have to also include that individual's um, occupation and their employer, okay? If the expenditure is to an individual and it's more than $100, that same rule still applies. You need to include their occupation and their employer. If you don't have the occupation and employer, you're gonna have some homework to do. Um, that same rule applies even if you're accepting campaign contributions online. A lot of people use it. I think it's pretty creative. Um, but if you're using PayPal or GoFundMe or whatever other resources that are out there um, where you're able to accept contributions online, just keep in mind you're still required to capture that information. Um, and if you just put requested on the CCDR, that doesn't get you anywhere. So <laughs> someone will see it and still be asking questions. Well, aren't they required to put this here? And then who knows what will happen next. So you definitely want to make sure you have that information um, on your report. Um, when an individual's contributions, when an individual's total contributions exceeds $100, you need to keep in mind that has to be itemized. The reason I say that is because a lot of times people think, well, if the contribution is less than $100, well, I don't have to itemize it. Well, what if that person gives you $50 this go around, and then they come back two months later, they give you another $50, and then another two months later, they come back and give you another $50? Well, their total contributions would have exceeded $100. Well, once their total contributions exceeds $100, you need to make sure that you're itemizing that contribution once it goes over that $100, well, the $100 mark. So just keep that in mind. Same thing with the expenditures as well, okay? Um, if you are self-funding the campaign, um, if you are self-funding, I'm sorry, if you are self-funding and using your own personal money to uh, help finance the campaign or you're making um, using your personal money to make expenditures on behalf of the campaign um, and you would like to be reimbursed, uh, that needs to be shown as a loan uh, to the campaign. And you can take a look at that under 21-5-41 under the code section that speaks to the maximum contribution limits. I want to say it's 21-541-H, I think. Someone may want to check me. It's G or H, I think. But I think it's H. It's H. See, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'll be really good when I know the page numbers. <laughs> I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, so yeah, check out 21-541-H. That speaks to, you know, basically that's the millionaire clause that says a candidate can loan their campaign a million dollars. But once the election passed, the most that you could recoup would be 250000 So if you are self-funding and you want to be reimbursed, make sure you show your contributions to the campaign as a loan. And that goes in the loan reporting section. Um, I also have another class that I do um, for how to complete the CCDR. So if you guys are interested, just check out the website. And um, sometimes I offer it as a webinar where we're actually online and then sometimes it's actually in-house. And then hopefully soon I'll actually be able to travel to different areas and do it at different locations as well. <laughs> so hopefully you guys will invite me back. <laughs> All right, um, so that's the loan reporting. Um, if you're receiving interest from the bank account, I think I mentioned earlier, make sure that goes on the summary page of the report. Um, when you guys are, I'm trying to think of another, a uh, question that I get all the time on the CCDR. Um, if you're not concerned with being reimbursed for the money that you put into your campaign, you don't need to show it as a loan. You can simply show it as an in-kind contribution and an in-kind expenditure, okay? Um, 
if that's the case. Um, any questions about the CCDR? Did everyone file their June 30th CCDR, or do we have, by a show of hands, well, by a show of hands, how many people filed the report? Okay, and then now by a show of hands, how many people are have the affidavit of exemption on file? Okay, <laughs> good deal. All right, any questions from anyone about the CCDR? Any things that you guys, maybe issues that you ran across or some concerns you had when you guys were reporting this a uh, few days ago or anything? If not, it's fine. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you, we did talk. Yep, we sure did. I remember. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But you already aggregated on the first time you reported the mm -hmm. 75. Do you add those together? Do you just say 25? You guys automatically know that this person gave 25, 25. We won't automatically, I won't know because I'm on the education side, but the other, the people on the other side, enforcement and legal, they can dig and they can find out. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, I mean, and that's, why I, and that's why I tell people, you know, if you want to itemize everything, you can. Um, you're not required to, but it may, it may be easier for you to do it that way. Uh, but yeah, once the, once the individual's total contribution exceeds $100, then from that point, you would want to make sure that you itemize it. So the first contribution of the 75, you could just show it with the, uh, the aggregate total on the summary page. but. Once that second contribution came in for the 50, that's the contribution that you want to make sure that you are, are itemizing with the name, the, the address, occupation, and employer. Any mm -hmm. questions that we get, can we use the handheld? Oh, sure. If somebody has that question, somebody else will have it again. Okay. No problem. Any other uh, questions about the CCDR before I move along? If not, feel free to ask later. It's okay. All right, the affidavit of a candidate's intent not to exceed $2,500. I get a lot of questions about this. Um, so I have one person here. No one else filed the affidavit? I guess everyone is out there spending money. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but he's. This is not a total representation of our elected All right. Okay. Oh, no problem. So uh, one of the the one one question that I get a whole lot about the affidavit is how long is it good for? Do I have to file it each year? Um, the answer is no. You don't have to file it each year. It's actually good for an entire election cycle. Anyone want to take a guess where you can find uh, the definition of what or find in the act where what an election cycle means? It's going to be under 21-53. <laughs> so uh, the definition for the election cycle is defined as the day after the election, and it runs through the date of the next election for that same seat. So basically, it would be the term of office. So if it's a two-year term, um, if you filed the affidavit this year during the time of qualifying, the affidavit that you filed this year is good through the day of your election this November. Um, and then the day after your election will begin your new election cycle, okay? Um, so if you want to file another affidavit the day after the election, you can if you don't plan to go over the $2,500 threshold, and then that will exempt you from having to file campaign reports either for the two years or for the four years that you'll be serving. Um, so just keep that in mind. It does not have to be filed each year. Um, it's only once per election cycle. Um, now, just keep in mind, if you go over um, that threshold, you will trigger reporting. Um, and there are certain reports, remember, that you file in an election year versus when you're in a non-election year. We did have a question. Yes, yes ma'am? I think he, oh, he's going to um, get you the mic. <laughs> If you didn't file this um, affidavit right after your election was over, can you file it any time? So the, affida the, the affidavit, uh, the exemption can be filed at any time, um, but just keep in mind if you're up against a reporting period, like with this June 30th reporting period that just passed, um, if you didn't file it on or before June 30th, then um, you should have filed a, a June 30th report. Um, and then 
afterwards, you know, if you do file one after that deadline, then it will go into effect for the next filing period. Mm -hmm. So just make sure you file one before the report due date. All right, um, so that's, that's the, the main, I guess, the number one question that I get about the affidavit of exemption is how often, you know, do I have to file it? And a lot of times people do get confused with the election cycle starting the day after their election. So um, just try to keep, keep in mind, um, this threshold does not include your qualifying fee. Um, so I know sometimes those are like $2,500 depending on where you're located. Um, alone, but the affidavit, um, the $2,500 threshold does not include your qualifying fee, all right? But it is a combined total of contributions and expenditures. Yes, ma'am, we have a question in the front. The, um, the combined total? So the combined total, it's, it's just a combined total. Well, do you need me to repeat the question? Um, so the question was, she, she would like me to just explain a little about what the combined total, what the combined total means of um, contributions and expenditures. So basically, it, it inc if you accepted three thousand dollars worth of contributions, then at that point you're already over the twenty five hundred dollars. Um, so just keep in mind, it's, and it also includes your personal funds. So if you're self funding the campaign and you're not accepting contributions from the public, well, your con your money still is considered a contribution. Everything outside of your qualifying fee. Um, so if you are self-funding and you put up $1,000 and you've accepted $3,000 from your supporters, family, friends, constituents, then you are, you've already exceeded the $2,500 threshold. Um, if you accepted $2,000 in contributions and then you went purchased, a, I'm not sure how much it costs to um, rent a billboard or lease a billboard, but I'm pretty sure it's more than, if not 500, more than $500, I can imagine. But at that point, you would have exceeded the combined total of the $2,500 if the billboard was 500 or even more than $500. So just think of everything coming in and everything going out. It's just a combined total. But I think you said it does not count to qualify. It does not, it does not include the qualifying fee, no ma'am. Yeah, you could. Yeah, because yeah, there is a, there's actually um, there is an advisory opinion. Um, if you go online to our website ethics.ga.gov, um, you can go to the complaints and legal section. And if you go to the legal under the legal section, you can actually search um, previous. Um, um, you can view the commission me um, commission meeting minutes. Um, you can also see uh, search complaints and. Um, search opinions that have been uh, made by the commissioners um, online as well. So, but they do have, a, I, I can't think of the advisory opinion number off top right now, um, but there is an advisory opinion out there that was done within the last couple of years uh, since the law change um, where they did make a, a decision um, on whether or not, well, they made the decision that the qualifying fee is not included in, the, uh, in that threshold. Well, it's not considered a contribution but there is an advisory opinion out there. <clears throat> Any other questions about the uh, affidavit? So basically, if you fill this form out and you fill it, file it with your clerk, um, you don't have to file those campaign disclosure reports. Now, um, one of the things I want to say about this, if you filed it during the time of qualifying, keep in mind it's good for, like I said, the election cycle. So if you don't file another one after your election, then that means you need to file that December report. All right, that's actually what I'm going to get to next, the filing schedule. Oh, so two, I'll come back to the two business. Oh, man. Maybe I'll just wait. Um, so yeah, so if you file the affidavit of exemption during the time of qualifying, remember the new election cycle starts the day after your election. Um, and you're st you still have a report that's due. Um, According to the election year filing schedule, you have the January, there's a March, a June, September, October, and December report. These are the uh, report, it's, I'm sorry, it's, I'm not able to zoom in, but 
Um, under the uh, election year column on the cover page of the CCDR, that gives you the filing schedule for your election year. So if you do not file the affidavit of exemption, this would be the schedule that you will be filing in accordance with. Um, so in, depending on when you filed your DOI, that's when you would actually begin filing. So if you filed the DOI prior to January 31st, then you would start with the January 31st report and continue filing through the rest of the year. Um, if you filed your declaration of intent in March, after qualifying or during qualifying, then you, your first report for 2018 would have been the March 31st report, and you would continue filing from there through December, okay? So if you filed the affidavit of exemption during the time of qualifying, you would be exempt from the March, the June, September, and October, but if you do not file another affidavit of exemption after your election, you will be required to file that December report. So if you want to be exempt from that December report, make sure that you file that affidavit immediately after the election. All right, um, so just keep that in mind. I hope I didn't throw anyone off. If I need to repeat it, just let me know or pull me afterwards. <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions about anything so far? The next form is the uh, two business day report. We get a lot of questions about this also. Um, the two business day report um, is a report that has to be filed within two business days of you receiving a contribution or a loan of $1,000 or more. It's not, it's not that you have to file this report every time you receive $1,000 within two days. It's only after a reporting period that's immediately before an election. So that would apply to anyone who had a primary. Um, so anyone who, um, let me back up just a second to the CCDR form again. I know it's hard to see, I'm sorry. But after you filed that March 31st report, um, that's the last reporting period before the May primary, right? So once you all filed that March 31st report, if you happen to have received a contribution or a loan of 1,000 or more after you filed that report, before the May 22nd primary, you could have triggered a two business day filing if you got a $1,000 contribution or a loan. You need, need me to say that again? <laughs> it's only on a, contrib a single contribution of $1,000 or more after a reporting period that falls immediately before an election. The most that we see it is after the March after the March reporting period prior to the primary, because usually the primary is held in May or June. Um, and the other time that we see it filed most often is after the October filing, October 25th filing period before the November general. So after you file that October 25th report, just keep in mind if you happen to receive $1,000 or if you make a loan to your campaign, you need to file the two business day report within two business days. And you also need to report that same contribution on your next subsequent disclosure report, okay? I know I said a lot, so if you need me to explain to you again, just let me know, <laughs> we can talk, yes ma'am. For the CCDR, uh, the election year schedule includes January 31st, March 31st, June 30th, um, September 30th, October 25th, and December 31st. Um, you guys can also reference that in the code, and I think that's under 21-5-34C, I believe. is actually on page 19, and it is 21-5-34, it's under, it is under C. Yeah, it's under C. That gives you the, the, the filing schedule there as well, for those, even for those who filed the affidavit of exemption. Um, the non-election year reporting schedule um, is just January 31st and June 30th, so it's a reduced filing schedule in your non-election year. Um, and as an elected official, uh, you also have to file the personal financial disclosure statement um, between January 1 and July 1. There's no grace period for the personal financial disclosure, so make sure you get it in on time. Uh, but those are the three reports that you would file as an elected official in your non-election year. The January 31st. <laughs> 
the June 30th <laughs> and the personal financial disclosure statement. Now, if you have the affidavit of exemption on file, you will be exempt from the January and the June report, but you would still file that personal financial disclosure, okay? All right. <laughs> Didn't mean to uh, alarm anyone. <laughs> We're talking about this reporting schedule. <laughs> I know you guys are thinking like, did I file that report? <laughs> All right. Um, keep going the wrong way. So yeah, we talked about the CCDR. We talked about the affidavit of exemption. We talked about the two business day report. Another time that you may have to file that two business day report um, for the runoff that's coming up on the 24th of this month, um, the, those candidates who, who are going to be in that runoff, they have to file a CCDR six days before that runoff. So guess what? Once they file that CCDR the, on the sixth day before the runoff election, if they happen to get a contribution of $1,000 or more after they file that report on the sixth day before the runoff, we're not talking about during the grace period. We're talking about the re um, after the report due date. Um, if they get $1,000 or more, they are required to file the two business day report, and then they would report that same contribution on their September 30th disclosure report, okay? So it can, it can apply to, uh, you know, your regular election year report, your non-election, no, it can apply to your election year report, a special election, or even a runoff, okay? The uh, final report and termination statement, this is the report that you would file when you are ready to close out the campaign. Um, when you're you know, leaving office or maybe you're stepping down, you're not gonna seek another term, everything has ended. Um, this is the report that you would file. Um, in order to be eligible to file this report, you, have, you cannot be in office, you cannot have any campaign debt, and you must have a zero net balance in the campaign account. Um, if you would like to know um, where to reference, you know, how to get rid of any leftover money in the campaign account, that can be found under 21-5-33. Um, that is the code section that speaks to the disposition of contributions. So there are a number of different things that you can do with the leftover money. You can donate it to a 501c3. You can donate it to a 501c4, um, a social welfare group. Um, you can also donate it to another candidate's campaign. Um, so there's a number of different things that you, that you can do with the leftover funds. You can give it to a church, to an L seminary. Um, if you are, you may not want to give it to a church that you are affiliated with or that you attend, um, but you, because you cannot receive any type of benefit from it. So they can't put your name on the, on a pew or up on the wall, um, or give you a proclamation or dedication or honorarium, anything like that. It, so just give it to another church that you may have visited. <laughs> um, you can give it to another candidate's campaign. You cannot use it for yourself if you decide to run for a different office. That is not permissible. Um, there is an advisory opinion out there. Um, I don't know the number. But um, you can definitely check that out online if you like. But uh, you cannot just use it to transfer to run for a different office. That's a big no-no. Um, but yeah, in order to be eligible to file the final report, the main three things, you cannot be in office, you cannot have any campaign debt, um, you cannot have any money left over in the campaign account. Now, if you leave office with money left over on the books, um, you, you will be required to continue filing supplemental reports until you get rid of that money or until you satisfy that debt. Um, to your question earlier, sir, um, if you are unsuccessful, you do not have to terminate. Um, just keep in mind you wanna file according to the, that non-election year and that non-election year and then in, when the next election year rolls around you would pick up with the election year filing schedule um, unless you decide to do the affidavit um, but uh yeah if this is the final report and then also the the final report looks just like a regular ccdr um, the only difference is the middle space section four instead of you selecting the period for which you're reporting you're actually telling us who's responsible for maintaining the campaign records and remember for at least five years past the termination date a lot of times it's just the candidate that's listed there um, if you self-funded your campaign if you um, have campaign debt um, if you take a look under 21-41 um, the law does provide that you can continue to accept contributions to retire that debt up to the maximum limits uh, that is allow um, so that's something to think about even if you are unsuccessful and you plan to seek the seat again in the future um, that's something that that you can think about um, if you did self-fund um, and you loan money to your campaign you do have the option to forgive yourself of that debt and if you do decide to do that that's reported as a contribution 
Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about reporting or anything so far that we've talked about? Okay. <clears throat> the uh, personal financial disclosure statement, uh, this form is filed once a year. Um, and by a show of hands, how many brand new candidates do, do we have? I know this is not everyone, but it, everyone that's here that's running in 2018, if you are a brand new candidate, just raise your hand. Okay, so any, inc any incumbent seeking another term here with us? Okay, um, so um, if, if you are a candidate this year, 2018, and you are a brand new candidate, um, you would not be required to file this form within 15 days of qualifying. That was the rule um, previously, but we did discover that there was an error in which the way that the law was written towards the end of last year, um, and that, that was stricken from um, the record, well, the, the code. So they don't require it for brand new candidates. If you did file it within 15 days of qualifying, I still say good job. It gets you the practice <laughs> uh, because you're going to have to file it again, you know, considering that you prevail. Um, so it's something that, you know, it's, it's worth getting, you know, familiar with. Um, it's nothing wrong with that. I know a lot of clerks there. Uh, I went to I had another session in, in Macon and um, the response was I was kind of it was funny, but <laughs> so many people, the clerks are so used to telling people that they have to file that report within 15 days. So, you know, sometimes the candidates, they're not as happy when they find out that, you know, hey, you made me file this report, but I really don't have to file it. But they're just so used to, you know, having that report that they're just so used to knowing that that report has to be filed within the 15 days that they really don't want you to get hit with that lay fee, so they're really trying to look out for you, honestly. <laughs> so if you did file it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. But um, if you are an incumbent seeking another term of office or, or, if, or if you are currently holding an elected office running for another seat, you are required to file the personal financial disclosure within 15 days of qualifying. Um, the personal financial disclosure statement always covers the preceding calendar year, like how we do our taxes. So the report that you file in 2018 will cover calendar year 2017 through December 31st. All right. Um, in your non-election year, as an elected official, so those of you who are brand new candidates right now, um, considering that you prevail and you're sworn in come January 2019, you would have from January 1, 2019 through July 1 of 2019 to file the personal financial disclosure covering calendar year 2018 through December 31st. Um, on the report, it asks different questions like if you accept any honorarium, if you have any business interests, um, if your spouse has any direct ownership business interests, so if you have more than a 5% share in the business or if the business has more than a $5,000 fair market value, you would need to list that information. Um, if you have any investment interest, if you have any 401k, if you have, I think it's a 457, any college savings accounts, if you um, have any stocks or bonds, you would list that information there. Um, as far as the 401k, if you have any mutual funds, you don't need to list the individual stocks and bonds that make up the mutual fund, but you do need to list the fund name. So if it's a Fidelity 50-50, I think I used to have like a, a life cycle 2050 fund or something like that, you just need to list the fund names on that on that section of the report. Um, other things that are listed on the uh, on the PFDS, uh, all fiduciary positions, if you hold a fiduciary position, it can be paid or or unpaid. Uh, and a fiduciary position is primarily um, you're serving for the benefit of another person. So if you are a trustee or if you sit on the board, uh, if you're on the board at your church or your homeowners association, um, you need to list your fiduciary re relationship. If you're on the, on the PTA, um, you need to list that fiduciary relationship. If you sit on the board at your church, if you're a trustee um, or a treasurer, you need to list that fiduciary relationship. If you are the executor of an estate um, or a trustee of an estate, you need to list that information as well. Um, if you have a spouse, your spouse's direct ownership interest in the business, if you have any dependent children, um, if they have any um, direct ownership interest in the business, you need to list that information as well. Um, there's also a section for you to uh, complete if you receive annual payments from the state more than $9,000. That's not talking about if you were, if you, uh, pre if you were a retired educator or if you work for the state. 
that's something that they can find out if they really wanted to find out that information anyway. Um, but more so like if you do like any contracts or business with the state, um, you would need to include that information. I actually got a phone call a few weeks ago because I don't see it a whole lot where people have to list information there. But um, just to give you an example, there was a coroner um, you know, who worked for the county, but they were also paid a per diem separately um, for um, transporting, you know, bodies to uh, the state, but that was, it wasn't within their normal duties of being the coroner. So because they received that payment, they needed to make sure that they listed that under section nine of the PFDS. Um, so, but if you have specific questions uh, about the PFDS, definitely let us know. Yes, ma'am. State or any subs. Uh, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, the question was if you if you have contracts with the, with the state, not federal, but with the state, do you need to include those contracts on Section Nine of the PFDS? And the answer is yes. If you have any state contracts and you receive more than $10,000 in a calendar year, yes, you would need to include it. Um, each section of the PFDS gives a brief description of the information it's looking for. Um, if, you fall in, if you fall within that scope of that information that's listed, um, I would encourage you to go ahead and report. Um, even for your real property, there's also a section for the real property um, where you need to include the address or the location of the property or the track, the value, um, things like that. So you have to do that for yourself and your spouse. So if your spouse has like a hideout spot, you guys need to have a talk, make sure <laughs> they're okay with you. Put, well, it doesn't matter if they're okay with you put it on the report, you're required to put it on the report anyway. <laughs> I had um, a few years ago, um, I had someone come into the office and you know they were like, man, do I really have to put my spouse's information on there? I said, yeah, you, you really do. <laughs> but I mean, you definitely have to put it on there. So. Definitely make sure you do that. Um, trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, any other questions about the PFDS or anything in general? All right, and again, the PFDS is filed once a year. So in your election year, as an incumbent seeking another term, it's filed within 15 days within you qualifying, okay? If you are a brand new candidate, it's not filed into, until your first year in office, okay? And in the non-election year, just keep in mind you have from January 1 until July 1 to file this report, okay? Win, lose, withdraw. So if you win the election, congratulations. Just keep in mind you are required to continue filing campaign disclosure reports if you lose. Um, or if you withdraw or disqualify, keep in mind you are required to file all the same reports just like a successful candidate. So if, you, um, if you're running in a partisan race um, and you have a uh, primary and you, and you get knocked out in the primary, then just keep in mind you have to continue filing according to that election year schedule. Um, so if you file the DOI in March, you need to continue filing March June, September, October, and December. Although you are unsuccessful, you need to make sure that you file reports through December 31st of that election year. Um, if you uh, file that declaration of intent and then you decide that, hey, I don't wanna run uh, prior to the primary because you filed that declaration of intent, you signed your life away to campaign finance, so now you have to file those campaign reports. So make sure you file them on time. Um, if you withdraw from the race, it's the same thing. This can be found under 21-5-34-I, I believe. If you want to take, yes, yeah, 2034-I, 1 and 2. Um, that's on page 21, towards the bottom on the left side, if you want to highlight that. Um, but that's the one loose withdraw rule. Um, that also, with the... Uh, with the, what am I trying to say here? Uh, with the win-lose withdraw, also for the supplemental reporting, you'll see that under 34I as well. So um, as an incumbent, if you leave office with money left over in the campaign account, you will have to file supplemental reports each year on June 30th 
and December 31st until you get rid of that balance, if you have a balance in the account. Um, and if you are just an unsuccessful candidate who goes into the next calendar year and you have money left over and you do not plan to seek the seat again in the future, you will still have to file supplemental reports each year on December 31st until you get rid of that balance. Um, so you definitely wanna go ahead and make sure that if you're not gonna seek another term, go ahead and close out the account so you don't have to worry about filing those additional reports. Um, and again, if you need to get rid of anything, that's gonna be under 21-5-33. Um, for the disposition of contributions. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, this is the 2018 election year filing schedule. Uh, you can also go online to our website, ethics.ga.gov, to print your filing schedule. Um, I always tell people, post it on your, post it on your fridge, post it on your, uh, your office, calendar, your phone, wherever you need to, to make sure that you can keep up with those filing, with those filing dates. Um, we do send out courtesy reminders, but they are courtesy. Um, sometimes everyone doesn't get them, and then sometimes people get all of them, even the ones that they don't need. <laughs> um, so just make sure you go online and print your schedule so that you have it for yourselves, okay? Um, the next report that's due for the CCDR will be the September 30th report. Um, that report would include all activity from July 1 through September 30th. Um, and after that, you have the October 25th and the December 31st. If anyone would like a copy of this filing schedule, um, just send me an email. My card is in, the, uh, in that blue folder, um, and I can send you a copy of this if you like. Sometimes people ask me for it because it includes the, the dates, the activity dates of what you need to include um, on that CCDR, so. But just keep in mind, the report due date is a cutoff date for filing. So um, that's the date. You don't wanna include um, any contributions or expenditures that you've received or made during the grace period on that report. So for what I'm saying is on that June 30th report, the grace period ended on July 9th, um, but you wouldn't show any contributions that you received on July 3rd on the June 30th report those would go on the September 30th report, okay? Um, the non-election year schedule is just January 31st and June 30th, and again, with the personal financial disclosure, no later than July 1, um, and there's no grace period on that personal financial again. Late fees, uh, they're 125 for each report that's filed late. Um, they do escalate um, rather quickly. If the report's not filed within 45 days, I'm sorry, within 15 days from the initial report due date, there's an additional 250 that will arise. And if the report is not filed within 45 days from the initial report due date, there is an additional $1,000 fee that will arise. All right. Um, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the people down at the office um, in our late fee and enforcement division, they will be the one to contact you um, about your late fees, so it's not going to be D'Angelo. <laughs> so if you see my number pop up on your caller ID, it's, don't be alarmed. It's, I'm just the education guy. <laughs> so is it <coughs> Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, but before they increase, uh, you will receive a certified notice of increase in late fees. So if you get some mail from us, that may be a little different, but. That's correct. That's correct. Um, like I said, they don't escalate in, unless and until you receive the certified notice. And actually, the local filing officers, we rely on you all to report who's late to us. Um, so, and for the candidates that are in the officials who are here, um, the filing officers have 30 days to actually submit the reports, the filings to us after you all submit them to them. And they also notify us of who was late or who has not filed. And then we take that information from there and then we would reach out and, well, they would reach out and touch from there, not me, but yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, but not to scare you, that's why I put the late fees at the end because hopefully I know everyone's gonna make sure that they get their reports in on time or make sure that they have the affidavit on file. So definitely, um, I know you guys aren't worried about this stuff here, so. <laughs> Um, if you do happen to get a, a late fee, you can use your campaign funds to pay the late fee. Um, your campaign manager may or may not advise you to do that. 
Um, but if you happen to get a late fee for a personal financial disclosure statement, um, you cannot use your campaign funds. You have to pay it out your own pocket, okay? Uh, contributions and expenditures, these are currently um, the maximum contribution limits for state and local. When I say state, I'm talking about um, House of Representatives, State Senate, District Attorneys, um, Superior Court Judges, those are state level offices, but state and local, um, the max limits are tw currently $2,600 for both the primary and the general, um, and an additional $1,400 for the primary runoff and the general runoff. And keep in mind, if you have that CUSA form, choosing the option of separate accounting, again, that would allow you to accept contributions for all of these elections at the same time if you needed to, um, if you like, okay? Uh, but just keep in mind, if you are, I didn't say this earlier, but if you do have the CUSA form on file, um, if, and if you are accepting contributions for multiple elections at the same time, um, whatever you've accepted for the general, just keep in mind you can't spend that money until you make it past the primary. And then of course, if you get knocked out in the primary, just you gotta give it all back, so. <clears throat> Any questions about anything so far? Um, the commission does have the authority to increase the maximum limits each year to adjust for CPI. They have not increased the limits since like December of 2015, if I'm not mistaken. So they may or may, they may, or may not visit it, revisit it towards the end of this year after the election, we'll see. Um, but you can check, just mon monitor the website for those updates. Um, and you can find that under the legal section as well. Um, while I'm talking about the maximum contribution limits, another thing I want to just share with you all, if you guys are accepting contributions from businesses um, or from people who have um, LLCs, um, keep in mind if that individual has a controlling interest in that LLC, um, they can't give you, well, if they give you the max from the LLC and they have a controlling interest, then that's the max that they can give you. They can't turn around and give you another contribution of $2,600 from their person because basically the LOC is operating as their alter ego. Um, so just keep that in mind um, if you are accepting contributions from businesses. Um, you can accept contributions from corporations, but if, if there is an affiliated entity um, or affiliated corporations, then together those entities together cannot exceed um, these maximum limits. Um, so just be aware of that. And you can reference all of this under 21-5-41. Um, uh, another thing with the maximum contribution limits, if you're accepting contributions from partners in a law firm, um, those, their contributions are considered um, to be made as pro rata in total. So if they're giving you the max as a partner, um, and then of course, all the partners don't have to contribute to the, to the campaign. They can you know, decide who's giving the contribution and who's not. Um, but if you have three partners in the firm and they're giving you the max limits, um, then they can't turn around and also give you a contribution, you know, from themselves personally, because they at that point would have exceeded the maximum limits. Um, so take a look under uh, 21-541. That section is actually pretty interesting. Um, you will see the maximum contribution limits there. Um, the limits in the code would actually be lower because they've increased since then, but um, all the other information in that section still does apply. Um, so you can reference the, mil the millionaire clause under 41. Um, under 41 is also where um, it states that members of your family are not subject to the maximum contribution limits, but um, someone may want to take a look under 2153 to see how they define members of the family. Um, and I'll just tell you that members of the family is defined as your spouse and your dependent children. So good luck. <laughs> So uh, just keep that in mind. It's definitely a good section to uh, reference later as well. Um, but yeah, I just want to let you know that. Anonymous contributions are prohibited. Um, if you happen to receive an anonymous contribution, uh, you can contact us and let us know. Uh, we will ask you to uh, either send us a copy of the cancel check or the, um, definitely let us know, send us a copy of the cancel check and you will have to send that contribution over to the state treasury department. Um, if it is an, if it's an anonymous contribution. Um, so if you're not able to um, capture the identifying information of the contributor, the name, the address, occupation, and employer, um, you definitely wanna try 
Think of it, so I, I tell people sometimes, what if it's your opponent who's sending you the anonymous contribution? <laughs> Just see if you report it correctly. Um, it, it has happened before. You guys all seem to be pretty nice people, so I know you guys don't do that type of stuff. <laughs> you have a question? You still can't accept it. It's anonymous. <laughs> uh, the question was, what if, what if the anonymous contribution is less than $100. The keyword there is still anonymous, so <laughs> you, you don't want to accept it. If you do accept it, you can show it as a contribution on your CCDR as an anonymous contribution, um, but you will want to also show the expenditure where you sent that over to the state treasury department. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say something else about the anonymous contributions. Uh, Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. So if you're passing the hat, that's a big no-no because there's no way for you to, you know, tell who put what in the bucket. So we definitely don't encourage you all to use that method when accepting contributions. It's okay for you to, you know, accept contributions online, go door to door because you can capture the, you know, the contributor's information. But just make sure, make sure you get their information. <laughs> it's definitely going to benefit you. Uh, any other questions about anything so far? I'm basically uh, wrapping up here. And some of this stuff we've kind of touched on already. But um, the millionaire clause, again, this is under 21541. Um, and again, it just states you can give an unlimited amount of money to your campaign. Um, if you were to loan your campaign a million dollars, um, if you do not pay yourself back before the election, the most that you can get back would be 250000 Um that's the millionaire clause. And again, I, we mentioned, I talked about the your family is not subject to the maximum contribution limits. That's also under 41. Um, expenditures should be ordinary and necessary. You can find that under 21-5-3. Um, so in the logic that I usually, that I share with people is think of, think of it this way. Uh, if you would have incurred that expense had you not been running for a public office. Um, if so, then it may not be ordinary and necessary. Um, and if you wouldn't, then it may be ordinary and necessary. Um, you can definitely go online and look at your state elected officials and statewide elected officials campaign disclosures. If we, I, it's, I'm not gonna say all the reports are right, um, but you can definitely take a look at it and just you know, use it just to you know, compare and contrast and you know, see what other things have been done. Um, and if you have questions about anything, definitely let us know. Um, but yeah, you definitely make sure that your expenditures are ordinary and necessary. Um, and again, that's referenced under 215318. Um, sometimes I get questions, I, I've seriously gotten questions like if I can use my, if the question was, can I use my campaign funds to purchase a suit? Or can I use campaign funds to go out and get me a new wardrobe or um, get my hair done? And that's, that's, you would be doing that regardless if you were running for office or not. And if you, if, if you, if you don't have a suit, I have a question if you really should be running for office. So, <laughs> you know, but, you know, even if it's not a whole suit, you know, there's places where you can go get, you can look get some nice pieces of clothing and you can still look nice, you know, so, but you, that's not something that you would want to use your campaign funds for. Um, the disposition of contributions, again, that's if you need to get rid of any leftover money that's in the campaign account, and that's going to be under 2153. So I mentioned that you can give it to another candidate's campaign, a 501c3, a 501c4. <clears throat> Civil penalties, and this just about wraps it up. Civil penalties, these come from the complaint process, so just keep in mind, um, sometimes the media is, you know, paying attention to these races. They're looking at your campaign disclosure reports. Um, the people in the community are looking at your campaign disclosure reports. Um, some people um, that are, have been around for a while, they may be coming through your reports with a fine tooth comb, looking for things. So um, just try to be on, be on top of it and, um, you know, contact us if you have questions. But from the complaint process, um, if there is a violation, um, if there is a violation for each violation, it's like a thousand. It's a thousand dollars per violation. Um, for every second or subsequent, there's a ten thousand um, dollar. 
violation on that. And then for each third or subsequent offense, it's a $25,000 uh, fee. So, and if you guys wanna check out some of the, uh, um, the rulings that the commission has had or some of the minutes, you can actually see that information online um, and you can view some of the um, things that have gone before, some of the complaints that have gone before the commission in the past. Um, and again, hopefully you guys won't have to worry about any of this. So I put it at the end of the presentation. I don't want to scare anybody. And um, I'm confident that you guys will definitely be able to uh, get through the campaign season um, if you guys just stay, file those reports on time, <laughs> at least file the reports on time. And like I said, just don't hesitate to give us a call. A lot of times people feel like they're overwhelming me with calls and emails, but I mean, it's, I really don't mind. It's, kind of like job security. <laughs> I appreciate it. I enjoy the work that I do. I really do. And I, I promise if, if you have called me, um, I'm not avoiding you. I know last week with the June 30th filing period, I was really swamped with calls and voicemails, but I really try my best to, you know, even sometimes I stay late to make sure that I'm able to reach out to everyone and um, answer their questions and concerns. So I definitely know how important it is. So I don't want you all pulling out your hair or anything like that. So. Um, <laughs> any other questions? How long have you been doing? Um, I have been with the commission uh, since December of 2012. Um, they hired me on right before I finished up at Georgia State. Um, and I've been training now for, actually December will be make six years. Um, and I've been training now for going on four. Yeah, going on four years. So. I'm still learning, <laughs> still learning, still learning. I'm still knocking at them. I'm still standing in their doorways and begging, begging them to give me more information. <laughs> so yes, but I definitely enjoy it. So it's, it's, it's fun. I'm glad that now I'm able to get out and get out of the office some and see more faces and <laughs> see the faces that, um, you know, the vo meet the faces of the voices that I'm talking to on the phone. So it's good. I enjoy it. So. My car is in the folder. Um, if you guys have questions or concerns, please feel free to uh, give me a call or send me an email. If you have questions during the filing period and you've called me, sometimes it's easier for me to respond to the email than it is for me to actually listen to the voicemail, take my notes, and then give you a call back. So just, um, if it's during the filing period, just bear with me, but I'm not avoiding you, I promise. So <laughs> we have to keep logs anyway of everyone we talk to. <laughs> but um, if you guys have questions, definitely I'll, uh, hang out for a few minutes, so um, feel free to come chat with me. All right. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all for attending this first training session. I do want to try to make this a yearly event and have D'Angelo and his office come uh, as often as they will come to discuss different issues or different changes in election law. As all of you all are may be familiar with election law and the laws that govern everything from campaign finances to elections in general, it's a living process that's constantly updated. I tell people, uh, we change based off of the lawsuit we receive. <laughs> And that's not just uh, an analogy uh, for the elections office. So we try to stay abreast and try to stay uh, ahead of the tide of any changes in election law and pass that information on to you all, the elected officials, the individuals working with elected officials. I know our office is committed to transparency and I know you all are too. So thank you all for attending this training session. Once again, there are food <laughs> items uh, on the tables uh, in the back. You have Mr. Hall's card. If you didn't get one of the blue packets, they're on the table in the back and you can contact our office. We will be making this presentation available on our website. Mr. Hall is not uh, <laughs> thrilled about this, but I will also have his slides since uh, some of you all could not view some of the slide presentations, you also have their website, which is readily available with a wealth of information, including uh, webinars and different things that you can walk through that will walk you through some of the questions that you have that you're directing at our office. <laughs> but thank you all for coming.